we're going to go through distribution, uh, look at some of the components of it. I know Robbie over here is going to school us on, uh, on distribution. We appreciate his uh, input. Um, how do we get the water out? Bonnie's treating it. Somebody's got to get it out to the customers. Here comes Rob to the rescue and, uh, <laughs> and get it out to the customers. And there's a lot of important components in the distribution. And again, going back to the Virgin Islands, I tell you, that's just like a hot topic for me right now. But they had some of the prettiest water you could ever imagine coming out of their treatment facility. But when, it, when the customer opened the tap and they had red water pouring out of their tap, that did it for them, you know? And they had issues with turbidities of out in the distribution system, like 65. I mean, that's, that's chocolate milk. So um, it doesn't matter how good Bahani's treating the water, if we don't have a good infrastructure, we're not able to move that water properly, have the right pressure, get it out to the customer, meter it well, make sure we're charging for what we're providing, then, uh, then it's all for naught. And that's what we keep talking about. There was a guy from the lab, and some of the people were not very happy, especially the condo association, so they weren't very happy. It's like, you had great water coming out. I said, yeah, but that's not the point. The point is at the tap. That's where you, that's, that's the proof is in the pudding there. So. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of the different types of storage, major components. We're going to look at some of the pumps and stuff, pumps and motors. Um, what's the big thing about storage? Well, we need to be able to equalize uh, how much we're pumping. If every time a pump kicks on, like at your home, every time you turn on the faucet, the pump has to start, well, you're going to have a lot of problems, a lot of wear and tear and all. So we need to be able to, to try to equalize that out over the, over the day. Uh, Y'all are actually pushing hard during the day, filling everything up, letting it drain down, come back in the morning and do it all over again. Uh, if you look at um, cycles and uh, um, continuous systems, you'll see that you have your uh, low demands, you know, sometime around noon or so, late in the evenings, when you're able to fill up. Then you're gonna have your high demands early morning, everybody's pouring water hard. Uh, late afternoon, everybody's getting home and, and cooking and all. So uh, you're gonna be able to try to try to equalize those pumping rates a little bit better by, by having storage and by proper pump sizes. Um, of course, a big issue is for firefighting like we joked about earlier. Um, yeah, the firefighters can stand there with their hose all they want, ready to run it into the burning building, but if you're not supplying proper pressure, they're not gonna be able to do their job. So we, we have an important job uh, for our community also. Um, and then of course we gotta have disinfection. And if you're injecting it right before it's being used, you can have as much residual as you want. If you don't have contact time, you've not properly disinfected. <clears throat> and it can sit there forever. If you don't have any residual, you've not properly disinfected it. Uh, inside the fence, we joke about production and distribution. Inside the fence was a clear well. Outside is a ground storage tank. Um, you don't have to worry about Texas requirements here, but you do have to worry about Tennessee requirements. <clears throat> and also, you have to look at AWWA standards. That's important. So when you're looking at screens, why do we have screens on our tanks? Got to keep out the varmints. Uh, don't want bugs and rats and cats and whatever else climbing up in their birds. We need to have a corrosion resistant. You all using stainless a lot out in your system for your screens? No, so, for, yeah. yeah. Using stainless on your screens. Um, flat valves, especially on overflows. The sixteenth of an inch, see them walk up to the quarter. If you can stick a quarter in there, you're gonna need to do something to adjust it, put weights on it or something like that. We don't get that technical. Huh? We don't get that technical. I've, I've seen, I've seen the blind. And we're blind. <laughs> so if you take, no. which way is the order? You don't gotta if or or you gotta have the screen and the flat. Yeah, in our rules, we, we oh you have, have to have, have the yeah. screen. Yeah, and and it. yeah see, so our flat valves, you don't have to have a screen behind it. Mm -hmm. It has to sit flush. It has to have a, a real small gap. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, I've seen them go up. Um, there's a lot of ways to counterweight it and stuff like that to make sure it seats properly. Um, entry port rim, what are your requirements on that? You gotta make sure that you have a curb up on there, right? Because you don't want water running off the roof, running up around your uh, entry port. Um, and then when we look at capacity per connection, is 200 gallons per connection. Is that what y'all are looking at here also? 200 gallons per person, I mean per connection. Out of your system, 
that I'm not sure about. I mean, it's okay. we're doing more of our engineering we do, we do section. So. so you don't have to have a certain amount of reserve capacity on your storage. Yeah. We probably do that. Yeah. Supply enough fire protection or something for yeah for so many days or. There is something in there around yeah, a day or something. There's something in there. Yeah, we're going to have to they, they talk about capacity. Yeah, yesterday yeah. I was talking about for 24 hours. You've got to have enough storage to, to be able to supply whatever your demand will be for that 24-hour yeah. normal demand period. Um, especially when you start looking at the uh, fire insurance boards and stuff like that. They want to know you got to have meters or uh, hydrants every certain number of feet, especially in the high-value areas. Um, and you got to be able to supply the proper pressure. you got to have enough elevated storage. You sure have uh, pressure loss, you still have some uh, elevation on head to help out with. Uh, ground storage tanks, are y'all using, uh, you got ground storage, you also use probably a uh, standpipes, do you have any standpipes for all it out there? We just have three storage tanks, ground storage. Okay, what's your capacity on them? Um, One billion. One billion? <coughs> so we're looking at our roof access, uh, looking at not less than 30 inches, if on the older tanks, if they are less than 30 inches, you need to see about having them uh, retrofitted so that you can have that proper access point. Um, maintenance, you're doing annual maintenance on them? Do you get inspections? Inspections have to be done every five years. Okay. I know we talked about the, um, um, one of the neat ways they do now is they can actually go in and dive and uh, do the cleaning on them, fill it up, put it out of service, go in there and clean. Uh, videotape or they can use cameras, underwater cameras. We've got a lot of uh, ones with the robotic camera. Yeah, that's a that's a neat way. It's an easy way to disinfect. <coughs> so, yeah, we were on an annual um, uh, cleaning cycle. That we had a lot of tanks, but they'd have them come in and, and real regular, isolate it and fill it up and, and disinfect themselves. They were in dry suits to go in there and, and scrub and all that kind of fun stuff. So. Um, we talk about AWWA standards. So the standards are engineering standards, and then we have to have approval, NSF approved products, with coatings, um, uh, bleaches, the uh, HTH, or um, yeah, the calcium hypochlorite, no lead products, um, you know, slowly but surely all that's being phased out, and then we've got to have the proper approval of the coatings. Uh, elevated, y'all don't have any elevated on it? Elevated is uh, beneficial if you don't have a lot of the, the hills and stuff. San Antonio has um, about seven, 800 feet of uh, elevational difference between the south side of town and the north side of town. So we got like 14 pressure zones. So there's a lot of, a lot of elevational change. There is still some of the elevated storage in town just for the different pressure zones. Um, and so the water's only up in the upper portion of it. Anything over the 80 feet is elevational head and 80 feet plus when you calculate it out that sixth grade math will work out to um, 35 psi and that's what our normal operating pressure should be so um, and that in texas if you have over uh, 2500 connections you have to have a certain amount of elevated storage uh, stand pipes see a lot more of those out in the in the smaller systems up on the hills and all uh, easy way to um, add elevational pressure as long as it's above 80 feet above the highest tap <coughs> then it's actually elevational storage uh, this is one of the questions uh, ground storage is uh, short and squatty and uh, stand pipes are, are tall and thin and say most of them are built up on the side of the hills and stuff bump it up to it and, and let the elevation uh, push it back in uh, hydro pneumatic tanks, do y'all have any hydros? Do y'all use a hydro pneumatic tank? Um, we use them mainly, mainly for surge protection, not for system pressures. We had a couple of real big ones out at the ASR facility because there was so much hydraulic head coming out. Biggest issue with them is uh, just maintenance on your, uh, your air compressors, your air compressors. Because you're putting air in the top and it's putting system pressure in there. So if you do have water hammer or search coming through, it gives you that cushion. <coughs> so that's a big component of the, uh, of the, uh, the hydrodynamic, the, the horizontal tanks there. Uh, 
uh, uh, annual inspections are recommended. Uh, not always practical, but recommended if the state recommends five. As long as you're making sure that everything's up to up to standards, then um, that's applicable and appropriate. Um, corrosion protection is important. We talked about the fire. We talked about our coatings. I don't know how often y'all have to have your uh, tanks painted and stuff like that or, or recoated. We just had two of them painted what uh, four years ago. Yeah. How long are you looking at? Are you looking at a ten-year cycle or? That's the first time it's painted since I've ever. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, <laughs> usually we go on uh, the tank inspections, uh, the tank inspections. That's all we usually do, like a, a paint analysis right. and stuff like that. And if, if they recommend that it be painted, then I mean, that whenever we do our inspection, we'll say, you know, you know we recommend that you follow through with the uh, tank, rec uh, tank inspection recommendations. Yeah. You'll have consultants that come in and do inspections, they look at wall thickness. And yeah, they, uh, they, uh, water systems will go out and, and hire okay. a tank inspec an inspection company, or a company that can do the tank inspections. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we really don't have a set time frame for, for the yeah. time unless it's it just, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's bad big up. chunks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a lot of it, you've got to be able to, to measure somehow, so you've got to consult some people coming in. And there's a lot of different factors that will that'll affect your, your coding line. Um, one of the interesting things in, in Texas, <coughs> everything has to be fenced off here. We're talking about it really doesn't unless there's some vulnerability. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you know, if there's a, a tank that's not fenced and, and there's obvious, you know, vandalism and stuff like that, yeah. then, I mean, you know, we'll probably say, hey, it's got to be fenced and secured. But, I mean, if, if it's already got six foot chain link fence with barbed wire around the top, and yeah. obviously it, take, I mean, it takes some effort to get in there, I mean, there's not much more we can, yeah. we can do to say, hey, you need to, you know, enclose it in a, in a dome or something yeah, like that. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you know, and that's what, and that's Texas uh, for uh, either the wall head protection or for the facility. You have to have at least 25 feet in each direction, six foot uh, cyclone with three strand of wire, 45, and that's your standard, uh, you know, uh, security for your system. Now they're getting into a lot of the cameras and uh, if you have any kind of ladders to be able to put an anti-climbing device on it, you know, just a lid that comes over and you lock it, you know, things like that to help minimize it. Um, we talked about uh, ownership signs, what should you have on it? And of course, you want your, the name of the facility uh, or the utility, you want to have contact information, and even wording about homeland security, uh, authorized personnel only, things like that, <coughs> can be very beneficial. Um, because then if there is somebody that's intruding in there, the, the penalties now are really, really stiff. Uh, used to, you know, out there spray painting on the side wasn't a big deal. Now it's a huge deal because uh, you're potentially compromising the, the water system. So, yeah. um, we talk about, uh, it's nice to walk up and see everything nice and neat. If you've got a hack through the machine to, to go inspect the tank, um, don't think that it's really necessarily uh, taken care of that well. So small things are important. Take care of the small things. And um, talk about sanitary protection again. We're talking about the residual. Got to have a residual. Uh, don't want the demand. Uh, Got to know where underground tanks are, especially if you're on a little groundwater system, uh, because underground storage tanks, uh, especially older abandoned ones, have a lot of issues. Uh, nowadays, you're getting a lot better with redundant, uh, you know, uh, self-contained, uh, self-containment systems and all. Uh, it's important to know where they're at, what's potentially impacting your, your system. Um, if you got cracks and leaks, got to take care of it. Uh, how do we prevent other things from getting in there? Uh, the both well head protection and uh, proper screenings and so on on your tanks. <coughs> and then any kind of repairs, we need to disinfect either new construction or new uh, What do we have out in the distribution system? Main service lines, meters. Uh, got our valves and hydrants and our pump stations. We have standards that we need to meet for them. Uh, then what of our what of our safeguards? Well, obviously we got to look at, at vandalism issues and stuff like that. We got to look at what the public's out there being exposed to. Uh, even fire hydrants. We get into fire hydrants, but now everybody's going to the breakaways um, because it's safer for the. If somebody does run into it, 
Uh, it's also not tearing up your system underground, and you're not blowing water all over the place. So those are, those are some of the benefits. Uh, and then we gotta make sure we maintain proper pressure. Um, what do y'all normally have out in the ground? Is it mostly duct tile? Yeah, we have duct, duct pool and PVC and poly all three. Okay, you got any uh, um, uh, asbestos AC pipe? Uh, not that I know of. Good. I, I ain't ran into that. Yeah, we had a lot in San Antonio. So that was a real big issue going in. And how do you do a repair on it? How much are you going to try to replace of it? Uh, AC pipe is. Uh, was was it wasn't great, but. You know. They've got some systems that still have it. Yeah, and some some have uh, little small amounts, some of it still have several miles. Yeah. I mean, so. Well, how's your water stability? You got issues out there with corrosion. The we have beta corrosion in here. What do you come up? Yeah. What do you? Uh, phosphate seventy three ninety. It's a, I guess our ortho. Yeah, ortho cars. Yeah, because that's a big issue if you don't have. Um, a stable water, normally groundwater, <coughs> stable water coming out, so you don't have to worry about a lot of corrosion factors, but surface water you can, <coughs> and then you're going to have a lot of problems with ductile and stuff out there over the long term. And if you don't have a stable water or slightly scuff on the water, um, HDPE is really coming along in a lot of ways. Have you seen the, the high density polyethylene pipe? The yeah. real thick wall. Yeah. Um, are y'all y'all we doing that? We're actually we doing now. We need to put the poly in. Okay. And you, you have a is a contractor going in there and, and, and fuse them together? We do. Y'all you have your own machine to, yeah. to plumb them and oh that's cool. Yeah. Well, um, now the contractor's coming in and done how well you said it because there's a fourteen inch pipe we can only do a eight inch pipe of oh, yeah. But I mean uh, what I've seen of it is making it pretty kind of the only way is Flexibility. <coughs> we were talking in uh, uh, the other another class out in uh, Middle Tennessee about the um, temperature differences and how that's affecting some of the when you when you're tying on your taps and stuff like that. I don't know if you all have experienced any of that. Uh, it, well, if it's cold, it, you can't. It's hard to put a put a tab on there. It comes yeah. to a certain temperature. Okay. So, I mean that, that's a, another good factor of the poly because when you put the saddles on it, ain't no mechanical fit anymore. Responded to the pipe yeah. all once. You know, and then again, the only way it comes off if it's properly done yeah. right, and the only way it can come off is if the machine tears it off. That's interesting. That's good. I, we had some big, uh, out at the ASR when they were doing an expansion project, they put in like some 18 or 24. It was, it was a pretty big pipe, but it was neat. Uh, I, I, I liked it a lot. And uh, especially out in all that soft sand and all, you know, you're going to have. A lot more movement out there in that kind of that kind of soil. So. Right. That's a little more time consuming for the sport. Good. Right. Yeah. In the long run. You know. Yeah. Well, and I mean, if you can get longevity out of the pipe, you're not having corrosion issues. You know, I mean, that that goes into a, uh, that goes a lot into your job. What what you're going to have to be up for. It's so it's interesting. What are y'all using for bedding? We're going to get into bedding, but y'all bed it with uh, sand or something when you. Uh, as long as there's a rock in it, we don't bed it. You know, if okay, it's you just rock, go back in the hole. rocky area, then it will, we'll bed it in the sand or something. But as long as it's just topsoil, okay. we don't bed it. You're able to go right back in the hole with yeah. it. Okay. Well, good thing is, is if you're using that fusible, then you're not worried about uh, pipe joints and stuff like that. Um, one of the main things, especially the older or the small pipes, using the, uh, uh, the solder stuff that has lead in it. Uh, there's a real strict uh, requirements on that now. Most people are moving away from it. Yesterday, distribution, when we get into the meters, they had an interesting uh, topic about having to go to a, a basically a lead-free meter lead -free. here soon. What is it, it's the beginning of next year? I think so. I think, I think Gary mentioned, yeah, January 2014, something like that. So that's going to be a big situation for people that are uh, having to start going and replacing. If you just went through a meter upgrade recently, I don't know when y'all went through to your uh or yeah. It was uh probably about six years ago. Okay. But, I mean, yeah, and I think all of our AMRs are already lead free. So if you had a major upgrade, then you already might be in the clear on right. us. 
That's that's what I've heard is uh, you know contact the, the manufacturer because a lot of the, the meters are already went through. Yeah. And so yeah, well, it's our original making <coughs> they told us uh, even if it wasn't lead free that you was grandfathered in, but mm -hmm. as soon as you broke connection to that, yeah. then that meter had to come out and you could yeah. never use it again. Mm -hmm. That's what we were talking about yesterday. If you pull it out, if you're actually doing your own meter testing, rebuilding or whatever, how do you forget about that? <laughs> <laughs> if you got older ones, you're gonna have to pull them out. Yeah. Especially when you start looking at your big meters, you know, compounds and stuff, yeah. then you're gonna have the potential, you know, some real cost incurrence with that. So. That was okay for the self thing. Yeah. But we're, we're actually in the process. We changed probably all of our three quarters of the one inch service taps, and now our big ones will start to work on them. And, and we're finding out that the, what we pay to change them out, they're paying for stuff within two months because of how slow they go. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, like I say, you're not going to have some of your customers that are going to love you. <laughs> but uh, just be careful where you're going to eat. <laughs> Don't wear your, wear your work shirt. But um, but uh, it's important to, to to charge appropriately. I mean, with anything else, and it's a lot of times people don't think about it in that way. But if you go to the grocery store, you don't want them to charge you more than what they're actually you know what they're taking home. And it's not right to get more and pay less. Right. Pay for what you get. And that's just that's the that's the right way to do it. Right. And so it's uh, and that's an, a real important revenue component in the organization. With our, I mean, we're, we're the state of Tennessee is putting an emphasis on water loss now yeah. and, and changing out the meters and getting that more accurate meter is, is part of that component now. So, I mean, it's, it's not only going to you know, provide them more, more revenue because, hey, we've got a more accurate meter that's selling that more, more water that's being used or it's not water being used, but it's going to help them on that because they, yeah. whenever they go in and do their water loss calculations, they're going to be able to raise their score a little bit because they've got, hey, we've got a meter change out. <coughs> That's very important. Do y'all have a leak detection program? Y'all using anything for a leak detection? Uh, we, like we used to uh, in house there for a while when we had the manpower, we used to mm -hmm. send them out and do a, a leak detection probably twice a month. They, they'd go out and in, in the evening because it's just a listening device and they'd yeah. have to do it at night when they're yeah, in you the don't have traffic and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've done the whole system, I think, twice since uh, since we started it, but it, it's something we need to check in a while. Yeah, you know, it's an investment uh, in man hours, and of course, again, you got to start looking at overtime and everybody, but if you're losing water and, and if you're under a requirement to, to be able to really account for it, then that's a huge component of, you know, preventative, as they say, you know, and that's prevention, but. I actually found a big portion of my water loss through the billing cycle because the, the numbers I was going by to the billing, the old meters that they had six zeros on, yeah. uh, they they calculated it up uh, with the six zeros already added in in the system, so they'd give me the consumption, and if it's just a, a thousand number consumption and it had two six zeros, that's actually 10,000 that I need to figure in where the billing don't, so that changes my numbers a lot. Well, we find that after the fact, you know, yeah. but that's that's just that's part of the process. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, we get into the valves, start looking it out in the system. What's our most common isolating valve? The ball valve. Yeah, either ball valve or gate valve, yeah. depending on the size of your lines. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we have the, the uh, altitude valves. You can use them for a lot of different things. You use them all altitude on your tanks. You use them on the discharge of your uh, high service pumps. Yeah, pressure sustaining valves, pressure relief valves. Um, so when you're looking at your cro uh, control valves, really you have two types. You either want to stop the flow, let it go or stop it, or you want to regulate it. So, um, y'all have attitude valves on your tanks? Yeah, on one of them. Yeah, we have one tank that's uh, a lot lower. Yeah, it's a lot lower than the other two, so we have the attitude valves. So yeah. It's fill. yeah. Yeah, you start looking at your hydraulic gradients and all. Yeah, yeah that's a that's something I really I like to get into. Yeah. Uh, start figuring out where where things should be floating at in your system, looking based on your pressures and all. <clears throat> so what do you do to be able to fill your tanks? So you're you're pushing 
just we basically it. just look at the read on one of them, mm -hmm. and then when we sit down, it's gravity flowing into the other two. Okay, so you got one up at a higher elevation. Mm -hmm. and that's when we worry about filling. Okay. What's uh, you said? Each one is about a million. Mm -hmm. What's your uh, clear well? We got three, and it's uh, we got six hundred fifty thousand gallon storage on the side. Okay. Three million. Yeah, and the distribution, but and they're all ground storage, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you talked a little bit about fire hydrants. Uh, one of the big things now is the uh, traffic completing the breakaways. Have you all upgraded into those? The base board. Yeah. yeah. And all the board. Okay. Um, dry barrel, especially in the cold weather. It's some out in California where they still have a wet barrel, but that's uh, don't know what the purpose of that is, other than it was a easier to work on the valves because everything's up on top. Yeah. But uh, yeah, any kind of cold climate, you gotta have a dry barrel. And um, most important thing, I guess, is uh, what do y'all do when they're out of service? Do y'all bag them? No, we, uh, we call the fire chief and uh, let okay. them know about it. And then okay. they, they document it through. Okay, yeah. so you got a communication back and forth with them on that? Yeah, we got it. Is it I know we we don't maintain the fire plugs that the uh, fire department buys when they maintain. Oh really? Them, and uh, we we do do the maintenance on them. Okay. So. That's an interesting relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So you get your so yours is up to the boot basically or the shoe where it comes in. Well, and, and basically. Are they are they doing the fire line? If, oh, if it's yeah. leaking or something like that, we we maintain it as yeah. far as maintenance part, but as far as uh, the flow rates and stuff on it, we, we kind of use their numbers because they got to do it by state every year too. Yeah. Instead of doing it twice, we just piggyback off of what they get and off the flow rates and stuff that the fire department does. Yeah. Do y'all bag them at all or you just do phone calls? They paint them. They, uh, they, uh, and now they paint them black if they're, if they're out of service. And okay. if uh, by the flow rate, they paint them different. Colors. Yeah, it's just so they can identify them. Yeah. Not, not collapsing your main. Right. <laughs> yeah, put the hook the pump on. Yeah, if I had a problem with it, just like tonight, if I had a problem with it, I'd call the fire chief and okay. the let him know, hey, this one's out of service until I get repaired. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's an important thing. And if you have that relationship, then hopefully there's also that communication about how to open and close them, which is a big deal, especially in the small yeah, town. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if one of the big things is making sure they have the right wrenches. You know, they're not, not out with a pipe wrench trying to open and close because they're just tearing up the, the operating gun on them. Um, in the little small areas, I don't know if they have competitions or what to see who can open and close it the fastest. But uh, that, that communication is really important. Um, and especially, you know, you can pull it up and hook it up to a hydrant and it doesn't work. And that's a, that's a bad situation, so. We, we've got a, a security lock way for somebody to be able to, yeah. to, to you know, back, 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 back. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge issue. Um, yeah, and also coordinating on when they're going to go out and practice. Because we'd have time, we'd have some little bitty tanks way off out in the, in the sticks, and they'd go hook up out there, and, and my pressure's dropping, and my tanks are just like plummeting, and trying to figure out, well, you know we got a giant leak out there somewhere. No, it's a fire department out there practicing. You know, about a phone call. That'd be really nice yeah. to let us know so that I can, I can start preparing, pushing water into that area. I can tell you maybe pull from somewhere else. So that kind of com coordination and communication can be real helpful. Talk about bleeding off. You ought to go in some of the auto flushing. Yeah. Uh, put out some little flushing devices and stuff. Uh, that's real important. Uh, saves a lot of man hours. That's going to have to go out there and mess with it. Also, we talked about with flushing, if you have problems in your mains. <coughs> uh, Virgin Islands, they have all this issue with turbidity. They'd open it up and let it run for you know an hour, two hours. It's like, you know, if you surge that a little bit, you can clean out a lot of that stuff out of there. Work that valve some and be able to pulse that water through there. You can do a lot more than just free flowing it for you know two yeah. or three hours while you're off the, the gas. And then on a 
testing and stuff that that's that's cool. Are you all able to test the compound also, the big ones? Do what now? Are you able to test the compound meters? No, no, we don't. We <coughs> you the send those off? Yeah, okay. if, it's a, if it's a big one, then we either send it off or if it's old enough, we can go ahead and replace it. Yeah. Yeah, and then like in San Antonio, they got to the point where it was cheaper than for them to just replace it and then send it for scrap rather than rebuild it. They had a real nice meter shop, but they were all doing all the big meters is what they were working on because it was uh, just not cost effective anymore to, to rebuild them uh, on, the, on the style that you have and the manpower and stuff. Sometimes it's nice to have the parts and be able to do it in house. Uh, talk about utilities income. You already talked about it. If you've got a, a meter that's not registered properly and it doesn't take much, a gallon per minute, over a thirty-day period, over a year, that how many meters you have out in the system? That's a that's a big issue. Where are y'all getting the revenue from for your uh, for your facility? Is it state owned? Or? Okay. They got deep pockets. <laughs> right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. This way. <laughs> yeah. Well, believe me, I know. Yeah, I work for the state. I work for the for the city. I'm back with the state again, and uh, it's interesting what they can find money for. Uh, paychecks aren't always the <laughs> and always the, uh, the high priority. <coughs> so, uh, what's your distances on separation between your water mains and your uh, sewer systems? Uh, we, we keep them uh, supposed to be a, a 10 foot okay. separation, and then the sewer line is supposed to be underneath the lower yeah. than, than the water line. But uh, most of our stuff is uh, across the road. I mean, we're probably a good 30 feet away. Good. Yeah. Unless it's just a crossing. You know. Right, yeah, and sometimes you have to, you got to cross a certain angles and all that. So, yeah. so it's not always nice to have a, a, a deep water up on top. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our trenches, our cover material. Um, uh, ref prefer just to at least a 24 inch cover. What do you all vary your pipe at? Uh, we like to go 36 inches, but uh, at the same time, uh, we do a lot of Okay. Trench safety, y'all building any shoring in there? You actually got boxes that should come and sit in? Or? Uh, we usually just uh, uh, oh, you get the shoring by bench and shoring. Bench it, okay. Yeah, nowadays there's a lot of neat hydraulics that you can use to put in there, and steel plates and, and, and hydraulic jacks and push them up really, really nice and easy. Uh, especially if you're over five feet, you need to have some sort of protection. Uh, depending on where you're at, you can do some other things. You can slope it out, you can bench it. Um, but if you're in the middle of town, it's not always uh, not, not easy. <coughs> and then, of course, you want to have your uh, spoils at least two feet away, preferably not on the traffic side. Try to get away from traffic so you don't have all the vibrations from the road. Um, like I said, sometimes you're working in an area where you don't have a lot of space. We have trench boxes if we're in the area. I mean, they're up there. We just got loaded up on the trailer. Mm -hmm. like that's, you know, that's real important. We start looking about the depth and ladders and whatever else getting in and out of the trenches. 
if you just do a small fight for pure normal, you're not that deep. But every once in a while you get into some of the bigger fights and you gotta get down in there and you wanna weigh out. Yeah. You know? I think you gotta provide what is it, every 25 foot? Yeah, it's gotta stick up. Three feet above, it's gotta be uh, 25 foot, so 50 feet distance in between them. It's gotta be a, a, a maximum of 25 foot from. Yeah, 25 foot from 20 minutes. No, you could, it's, you have to be within 25 feet of the ladder. Oh, okay. So they can be 50 feet apart. Because <clears throat> then if you're right in the middle, then it'll be 25. Okay. Yeah, and it's gotta stick three feet up above it. Yeah, for your, for your ladders and stuff. Um, pipe bedding, uh, they prefer at least four inches or the quarter of the diameter. I talked about, especially uh, here, it seems like if you're able to pull out something decent, you put it back. We got a lot of rocks, so anything we pulled out, we always bend it back. We tried to use a, like red sand, stuff like that. That was pretty available for us. You can get into the pea gravel. Um, better to tamp it in. Got to make sure it's a, a nice bedding across. You don't want to have high spots or, or you don't have bean grease, things like that. What are y'all doing for bracing? Y'all just pulling a lot of thrust blocks or you just a mechanical? Uh, the only time we use the uh, bracing is when we uh, go through a uh, casing, you know, just uh, any casing that goes under the hardware thing. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah. About it. Okay, what about for like your hydrants and the fire hydrants and stuff? Do you know the thrust blocks on them? Uh, well, with the poly pipe now, the, the, everything's fused, you don't have to. You don't even have to put an uh, altar in or nothing in it anymore. That's Basically, everything's all solid. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, put it together, you just use gravel to, for your seat toes, and that's it. Yeah. So is it coming in as a, um, a fixed ID on it? Yeah. Uh, the fire, when the fire plug comes in. Yeah, it's already. And then when you fuse the two adapter pieces together, the, the, the mechanical part that you tie into the adapter it can't pull off of the adapter at all. So it's almost like, have you ever seen the ductile iron fit into the mm -hmm. solid? Yeah. It's almost like that, but it's made out of poly. Seems like you're a big big fan of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anything you ain't gonna mix concrete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Or trying to put it all thread underground and all that, you know, trying to put in a, a mechanical uh, restraints. So, yeah, I'm used to the old school where you're out there and you make your little four and pour it, and Wrap and then it the plastic, take yeah. it up, and then something goes wrong, you got a jackhammer and try to yeah. take the boat apart. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always find this interesting. They recommend that the trenches are dry and clean. Yeah, try to, you know, <laughs> go out to a site and actually find one that's dry and clean. Yeah. You haven't had any water in it. Um, but we do want to make sure that the ditch water isn't getting back in the pipe. So you, we're, we're digging down properly. We're digging a sump for it. Um, we do want to make sure that uh, we're not trying to cross contaminate it. That's a big issue, um, and we can uh, swab it. Y'all, y'all have some provisions to swab as long as it's still under pressure. <coughs> um, if you do have to leave it for a while, cover it up. Uh, and then there's some methods for um, for coronation, uh, tablet, the uh, continuous, and then the slug. Obviously, with the requirements from the from Tennessee, you don't want to have to slug it. That's a that's a lot of work. Um, so I guess if y'all are still, if y'all are swabbing, that's all you need to do, then you're flushing it and you're sampling it. No, we're doing construction. We actually use HGH. Do you? Okay. Yeah, the new construction, it's a little bit easier to, to introduce it as you it is. You yeah. know, that versus a line repair where you need to be closing it up and really don't have it under the line. Yeah, and they, they were actually, they would put in a tap and come off of 150 and actually hit it with a chlorine gas. And that was, that was real effective. Um, Especially because there was just so much new construction going on that they were out, out taking care of. And we talked about the slug method, moving it down the moving down the line. But if you have a real high concentration, you gotta you gotta dechlorinate before you can uh, before you can um, discharge it. And then always, if you want to flush them, you take back to these uh, dead ends. How often do you flush them? Never know. That's excellent. Yeah, and sometimes they're like, well, when we we'll get to it. We have one guy that's just a uh, his job. He works under barn and he just goes out and gets uh, corn individuals and flushes the, the whole system. And then after he finishes that month, then he starts the next month doing them all over. Yeah. Until Eric says we can do them by month. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, 
mean, it, it, that's a really that's a really good way to do your program. And yeah, you're dedicating one person to that process, but that's a really important process. Yeah. So, um, and one of the one of the real benefits, you know, especially your bio slimes, things that are produced in there, uh, help get rid of that that skill buildup. And uh, if you are having red water issues, as you're starting to go to poly, that'll that'll help you decrease if you don't have a lot of iron in your source water. That's a real benefit. Yeah, well, as you start to move away from the ductile, that's a, you know, you reduce that, that source also. Uh, we do want to make sure we have um, fresh water in our area. Uh, talk about water age, real important, especially now with dissipation byproducts. And then if we are having uh, problems out in our distribution system with keeping the residual, we need to look and see what's, what the demand might be out there. Uh, like everything else, you've got to be careful with all this. So don't let the volunteer fire guy go out there and <laughs> flush your system. Um, tuberculation is the buildup. It's actually the nodules that, that build up in there. And uh, if you're if you're not flushing your system properly, when you do go out and flush, you can break a lot of that loose. And now you got to have a lot of complaints. Uh, people are not going to be happy with the, either the water from the or with their uh, fixtures being clogged up. Um, <coughs> corrosion, y'all are already taking care of corrosion by uh, uh, adding orthophos. That's, that's a helpful uh, product. And then um, we're also looking at making sure that we're coating our tanks and we're using product protection to minimize the uh, tank damage. Um, what's going to make it uh, a corrosive water? Low pH, uh, a lot of dissolved oxygen in the CO2. Uh, Y'all don't have much issue with salts. Free chlorine itself is aggressive, looking for looking for interactions. Uh, and if you don't have stable water, you don't have any harvest and stuff, you're going to have a corrosive water. Um, pushing water real fast, high temperatures, uh, low alkalinity, and then it's supposed to be sulfate reducing bacteria. Will actually um, cause corrosion factors also. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to coat our stuff. We're going to use cathodic protection. Um, dissimilar metals is a big issue with a, a galvanic. Um, so we, we treat our water, then we can use the dielectric union. <coughs> we have different types of metals that can help um, diffuse that electrical um, uh, interaction that's taking place. Y'all are already doing all the main repair stuff. Y'all actually doing? Y'all have to do small repairs and stuff out on your system. You got nothing out there? Oh, we don't care. Oh, <laughs> wow. So y'all are just going out and running just maintaining the system? Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a sweet, that's a sweet job. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? That's a, that's a sweet opportunity. It's a very free world. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's some of the contract, though. They just want you for, you know, your operating experience. And that's, that's excellent. Um, so we'll talk about the main breaks. Um, real basic, obviously you need to know what you what you have out there, have you the right kind of equipment. Um, when we do have a leak, we're going to uh, excavate on both sides, we do want to make a sump so that we can get that water away, keep it from getting in the pipe, being able to run a uh, trash pump on the side. And uh, if we can do it hot, that's always better, especially if you're just doing, uh, have you had to do any repairs on the on HGPE? On the? No. The, the poly? Yeah, it almost, the lower was like the uh, two inch and stuff. I mm -hmm. never had to Were you just able to put a sleeve on it? or? But yeah, well, the actual, uh, the, it's IP, uh, type size, iron type size, but you're still able to use the brass uh, dresser cup on, on the poly too. Okay. Because it's hard, you'd have to drain the line and then get all the water out of it and fuse it back together. So, right. so basically, we just use it and it's got the little nut on the end that you tighten it down, mm -hmm. keep it from slipping apart. Yeah, a little mechanical. Yeah. Very cool. See, I've, I've seen it as it was going in, but I haven't seen it out in the distribution system being worked on. So that's that's why I'm picking your brain on that. Is, uh, it's interesting to see because it's becoming more and more uh, I mean, popular. It, we've got the, what we've got, <coughs> just in case of the, the big lines is we went with the electro fusion equipment that way if we had to, we could uh, electrofuse it because if not, you'd have to dig back way back and yeah. fuse it together. So the electrofuse equipment would uh, 
work just like a sleeve. And once you get it on there, then just throw the juice to it. Pretty cool. How much, uh, how expensive was the equipment? The, I don't know what to say. We got two of the, the, the fusion equipment, but mm -hmm. the fitting, they're pretty high. They're, they're about 150 bucks a piece for the six inch. Yeah, but if you're not having to put a lot in, right. you know, if the pipe has good longevity and good resilience, then uh, um, obviously we want to make sure we try not to interrupt service for longer than we need to. Um, that so if we're repairing it hot, that's going to help that, and also we're going to um, reduce the risk of the contamination. We're not going to have to flush as long with air issues, and uh, and then also you know when it you know if it held or not when you hook it up. And you still got pressure to it, you know, when you seal it, we're talking about with the, uh, just doing the repair kits on a, on a 150 cylinder, and you've got it set up where it's blowing water, you know, pretty quickly you need to seal. So. Cross connection, uh, real big issue. Um, how do we prevent it? What's it gonna do if we don't? I don't know if you're using any recycled water, you know no, what I mean? No, we don't use any recycled water, but we know we've got all kinds of functions that we monitor their uh, back folks in. Okay. Are you VPAS certified or? Yes. Oh, cool. Very good. Yeah. We've got uh, a water system over in Middle Tennessee that's using recycled water because uh, it's going to a, uh, a golf course mm -hmm. for the irrigation. And we've got a, a system over here that's uh, looking at probably doing it at one of the parks yeah. uh, here in the next maybe a year or two. Uh, we're looking for uh, wastewater plant upgrade to uh, be completed. Yeah. So it's, it, it'll become a it, more, it's, more emerging plant. It is. It's really coming up. San Antonio has the largest recycling system in the nation. I mean, they push, I don't know if it was 30, 40 million gallons a day recycled around wow. for, for golf courses, and um, a, a number of industries are able to use it. Um, all A lot of the big uh, buildings for all their irrigation and stuff like that, they, they push a lot of water uh, for their uh, recycle system. So that's something that, it, especially if I can water grass with, with recycling, yeah, go for it, you know, as opposed to putting potable water out on the ground that's limited resources. We had a company that's looking at coming in the industrial department questioning us about if we could get them to get yep. the water. So, yeah. You know, that, if they did come in, does that change the company that I got monitored? Well, <coughs> we don't have any, anything on that. Right. Um, Basically, I mean, it's a backlog thing, or yeah. Yeah, that's basically all we're worried about. Yeah, I mean, um, the system of the Milton City is putting it in right, right as I look over here. Um, and, you know, we didn't have anything in, in the regs because it was going directly to irrigation. So yeah. it wasn't being used for potable right. purposes. So. As, as of right now, I'm not aware of anything that you'd have to monitor. I mean, even if you can think of it, the only thing that you could do is just the back of the Well, you've got to keep them, you got to keep your system that's separated. separated. That's the big, yeah. your biggest thing is getting into your and that's uh, cross connection control. Four things that, that came up was in, in the system here that, that wants to use it for the park, but I wanted to use it for the toilets also. And once it got to the, to the building, it was going to be all caught in the pipe. And so that, that's a concern for us, is if you got copper pipe in there and it's not marked, you get a plumber in there that yep. you know, may, may not be paying attention, he cross connects between the sinks, and that's a concern. Yeah, so that's, yeah. 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 If I go in and inspect it, I mean, you know, I'd have to run through the whole system just yeah. to follow it out. Yeah. 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 So I mean, right now, uh, as far as using it for toilets and stuff like that, um, we really don't have a policy, and that's something we, we definitely need to be looking at. Um, but, I mean, if, if, like I said, there, there's a system already used for irrigation on a golf course, and I'm not aware of any issue, I mean, any sampling or requirements yeah. on that. So. The, the most important thing, and we had an issue in San Antonio with it, is um, when you're having golf courses and you have somebody out there that's not familiar with the pipe, and they have a leak and they're going to go and repair it, and that's where your cross connection potential is. Yeah. So knowing who has recycled systems, and if you start having water quality issues out in that area, you know where to start looking. 
that's that's really from your perspective, that's one of the most important components of the only better some rule is to say God is just go ahead and have you the back folks set up at the meeting. Yep. So um, so yeah that's a, that's a real you know, we talk about cross connections and there's so many different potentials for it. Even the garden hose sitting in somebody's you know, so that is that people just don't realize. And then you go to school and learn about it. <coughs> yeah. Well, there's so much that I've learned on the, the cross connection part that, that I've done it to keep it's <laughs> like right now, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, we talk about in San Antonio they're putting an ordinance for all the new homes have to have uh, vacuum uh, breakers on their on outside of those windows. Um, but people don't realize just the sink in their kitchen, if the um, if the way that their faucet is set up extends below the lip of the uh, the, the basin for their for their kitchen sink, that's a back um, cross connection right there. Uh, had a big issue. They do a lot of water water hauling in the uh, Virgin Islands, so they have these trucks that pull up to the actually the public water systems distribution site, and they've got um, they've got an overhead that's coming in. Well, we're touring, and I look up, and what do they have? They have a cam lock system on a rigid pipe. They hook up that extends below the level of the tank. You have a cross connection. You don't have an air gap. You know, um, vacuum preventers. Their their big thing is a is a double check. And I'm like, you know, that's that's a, that, it looks pretty, but uh, yeah, we can reduce pressure. So you know, um, check valves are easy to fail. Yeah. So if you really want to do it, set up an air gap. If you can't do that because it's got to be under pressure. Um, but that, that's a big, and I, 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 I hear you there. Uh, I don't want people back feeding in the, you know, even in the, in the plant. I don't know how many backflow preventers y'all have in the plant, but every, whenever you pull off processed water, you're supposed to have a backflow flow preventer so you're not pushing, pushing water back into your system. Do y'all have any? Yeah, we got the main one coming from the uh, from the tunnel. The only one we really got. Yeah, the only one we said. So that's something to think about in your in your plant because the way we had it set it up, we were feeding our own water from our clear well into our into our distribution, and then we pull off a processed water to different places. Every place we pulled off a process, we had a backflow preventer because you don't want to. Even if you're protecting the main, mm -hmm. you still got to worry about what's in the plant. Yeah, anyway, just something to think about. Uh, most uh, tried true air gap, uh, especially I don't know out in the plant. If y'all have off of your back wash and stuff like that, y'all have an air gap set up on. Uh, well, you know, like we'll use the hoses and all for the mm -hmm. wash down. We'll make sure that they're not draped down in there where it could be. Yeah. yeah. We had a big uh, gooseneck coming off of our um, um, for our back wash, uh, going through our back wash of recycled water. Uh, would actually go up through an air gap. You know, I mean, that was a probably a 36 inch pipe and a gooseneck. That was pretty pretty cool. But that was a nice air gap so that you didn't have any back siphon coming from your backwash pipe. So a lot of it depends on how the age of the plant, how it was designed and stuff. Uh, especially on your humidity um, uh, meters and stuff like that. A lot of times they'll have air gaps set up in it. Um, so that's I agree. That's a huge issue when you start having a lot of recycled system out there. It's great to utilize that water, but you got to be careful who's out there playing around. And then where to start looking if you start having water quality issues. And that's what happened. It was in a real high, high end area of town, a nice golf course. Somebody out there had a metal repair, tied it in improperly. So they were back feeding recycled water into, into some you know high end homes. So they got a lot of attention real fast. Um, emergency preparedness is a big deal. You've got to make sure that we know what's going to happen. We talked about it in Tennessee. I'll have a lot of issues with the flooding and with uh, tornadoes and all. <clears throat> we have the, some hurricane issues down on the Texas coast. So you've got to have stuff set up. You need to know what kind of parts you should have available. Who's going to go where? Who's going to do what? Where are you reporting? What are you reporting? Uh, before the storm hits, after the. Um, if you do have a chance, I know y'all are already filling up your tanks on a daily basis. If you have a chance to go out and isolate it before a big storm hits, so that you have water available. I don't know if y'all utilize that as a technique, but that is an option that you might have. 
maybe you can't isolate them all. Well, you isolate them all, nobody's <laughs> <supplies> <laughs> the water. You know, so that's part of your system dynamics. You have to so they it. rather take their chance and have water <laughs> before the have storm now, and, have <laughs> not, now and not later. <laughs> yeah, so, but that's all part of the community. <clears throat> and then make sure you have enough things to uh, uh, to disinfect and to uh, repair properly. And one of the big things is is looking at your emergency procedures. You know, not just write them and put them on a shelf, but actually look at them, go through them on a quarterly or semi-annual basis, figure out what you're going to do when you're going to do it. Um, get into pumps a little bit, uh, centrifugal pumps, uh, real common out in the system, uh, especially coming off of your uh, storage tanks and all, your high service pumps coming out of the uh, treatment plant. Are you all using centrifugals coming out of your plant and stuff? Or? Are you using a vertical shaft turbine? Uh, vertical, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'm using yeah, a vertical shaft. We came out of our, uh, at ASR, we had vertical shaft, and then out in the regular distribution, we'd have a lot of the yeah, centrifugal pumps. No, we, got, base ones on. we got one horizontal, and the other three vertical. Okay. So this is a split case. Um, really good pump, a lot of longevity on it. Uh, obviously, we got to make sure it's filled up with water. Uh, in the volume, and we need to have a, a check valve, foot valve on it to keep it full, so it doesn't drain out. The uh, the process of the pump as it rotates is not cupping the water, but it's actually slinging the water, and it's pressing it up against the wear ring on the volume to create that that uh, pressure, that energy going from a rotational into into pressure. Uh, looking at uh, some of the uh, terminology. Suction lift, you want to have to pull the water up a certain amount to get it to the center of the, the eye of the pump. If I've got elevational storage above it, then I can push the water a lot higher because I don't have to pull it up in the air. I've got that uh, added to it. Um, deep well turbine, you're looking at the, uh, so this is a submersible, you can also have vertical shaft. And then however many impellers you have, depends on how many uh, stages or bowls that you have to push it up to high elevations. Some of ours were, you know, three, four hundred foot deep, so we run six bowls on it to be able to push uh, about two and a half MGD. Um, again, if you have anything that's uh, oil-based, you need to make sure that it's um, NSF approved. Uh, what are we going to look at if we're looking at pumps? We need to know how much we're going to pump, what are we going to push up against, and what are we pumping? We're going to put a slurry in the plant versus pushing water out in the system to make sure we uh, have the right kind of pump. Um, cost is always a factor. How easy is it to get the pump itself and parts? That's important. And then pump efficiency, especially from an engineering standpoint. Um, pumping, normally we're going to look at either gallons per minute or millions of gallons per day. Uh, head is uh, what we're going to have to push against, either through this line or elevationally. Uh, static is where things aren't flowing. And then we have our dynamic flow also actually moving through the pipe. Um, we talked about suction head, discharge head, what are we going to have to push against, what's actually in the line that we're going to have to overcome. Uh, frictional head, especially when we talk about some of the uh, higher licensing, you actually have to go in and determine what your frictional losses in the pipe are over a distance, how much you have to pull up, how much you have to push out, uh, where you push into in your elevated storage, and all of those are calculations that will actually go into your total dynamic. Everybody knows pump curves. Yeah, pump curves. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much y'all actually deal with them. I know especially in the distribution, probably don't look at them a whole lot. But when you start having problems, you can go back and determine the pump curves or when you're trying to select, determine if you need to upgrade. So you can, you're looking at your total dynamic head, how much do I have to push against, how much am I trying to push? Uh, I'm trying to push a lot of water, trying to push it a long way, a lot bigger motor and my efficiency is going to drop off a bunch. So, and then the MPSH is your net positive suction head. How much do I actually be pushing down to be able to, to meet that requirement? And then your three types of uh, pump curves, you have your head capacity, how much am I pushing against, what is my efficiency, and then how big a motor do I need to, to push that water? And a lot of them, this is working on the, the the RPMs, the 1750, 1450, a lot of times you can change your color sizes to be able to increase your capacity. <coughs> pump efficiency, 
Um, obviously, as your, your head increases, your efficiency is going to decrease. Um, if you've got to pull the water up a long ways, uh, if you've got old equipment, uh, worn impellers and all, you're not going to push water as easy. And if you push it against a lot of pressure already, you're going to have a lot of efficiency issues. Uh, talked a little bit about O&M earlier. So obviously, we need to keep the room, uh, room clean. We need to segregate our, our chemicals, uh, make sure we don't have uh, cross-contamination or uh, incompatible material where we have fires or things like that. In the lab also, we segregate our materials. Um, make sure that we're able to, to keep the, uh, the water in the, in the valve with a, with a check valve, foot valve on it, and we need to make sure that we have a proper uh, valves installed, especially at the gate valve. Um, I don't know if y'all are doing in the plant, if y'all are getting into like uh, alignment on your motors, like laser alignment and stuff. When they installed the new ones, I did it, but you yeah, not, not part of your maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I, I, uh, I promote a lot when you're looking at a, it, even on a basic o and program, is you can go to the auto parts store and you can buy um, an infrared uh, thermal detector, temperature detector. They're not that expensive, 100 bucks or so. And if you look at your bearings and you have it a regular part of your program, you can look at your bearings, you can look at your leads coming in on your uh, switch gear, and you can determine when you have hot spots. And if you have a hot spot, you know you need to go and take care of it. You got a bearing that's burning up, you got a lead, <coughs> excuse me, you got a lead that's going bad. And if you do that ahead of time, you can you can prevent a lot of catastrophic failure. Or we even had switch gear fires that burned up a lot of stuff because we had um, lead, lead issues coming in. So those are easy ways. If you can't afford the ultrasound you know, uh, vibration and all that, ultrasound vibration analysis, which is your high-end predictive maintenance, um, something simple can really go a long way to helping your, your plant. Um, what do you do if you have a, a pump rotating backward on a three-phase? How do you fix it? Switch into two leads. Three phases. Straightforward on a, uh, if you uh, do a reinstallation and you, and you bump your motor. <coughs> I apologize for my voice, it's like really, really fast. Uh, cavitation, little micro explosions or implosions. Um, when you have uh, substantial differential pressures uh, coming into your uh, pump, seeing it eat through a volume, I mean, just completely tear it up. And of course it'll tear up your color also. Uh, and then water hammer is a big issue. Um, pump sanitation, gotta keep away the contaminants. Uh, gotta make sure we're not sucking it in. Um, you gotta make sure we're maintaining the proper pressure coming out. Uh, electric motors, uh, squirrel cage is the most uh, common, simplest to, to, to deal with. One of the big things is, is ventilation. If you put them into boxes, if you put them into small side areas, decrease the service life on it because you're going to, uh, the insulation is going to uh, degrade on it and it's going to go to ground on you. So if you can work on your ventilation, that's a big thing. A uh, little example of a squirrel cage. And that is it for distribution. <coughs>